trial attorney Justin Leto to talk about what happened on Friday and maybe what we can expect today. Good morning to you, Justin. How you doing? Good morning. Thanks for having me back. Thank you for being here. So we had the direct of Paul White that's over. Based on everything that he said, do you think that he was able to advance the defense's theory? Well, all he has to do is create some sort of reasonable doubt for the jury so that they can find uh, Dr. Murray not guilty. And I think when you have a case here where you have a battle of two very well-renowned experts that are saying two very different things, it creates a potential for a lot of doubt in the jury's mind. What Dr. White is saying is that one situation happened, uh, Dr. Schaefer saying another. The one thing, though, that's clear is that Dr. Schaefer admitted that Michael Jackson, Jackson could have self-administered it by turning the, uh, the, the dosage on, even though Dr. Murray was there and actually gave him the IV. So I think there is a bit of reasonable doubt there that I think the jury's going to be able to hang their hat on if they choose to find him not guilty. Okay, but is that enough? Uh, it may be reasonable doubt, but does that absolve Dr. Murray? Because there's no doubt there's a list of standards that he deviated from and no doubt that the prosecution is really going to hit that hard today with this last witness. Well, whether it absolves him of any type of negligence is one thing. Whether he's guilty of a crime is another. When I was on the show last week, I said, I think that Dr. Murray committed medical malpractice in this case. I think he's civilly responsible. I think that he should have to pay the family for the loss of Michael Jackson civilly with civil damages. So it's not about whether it absolves him or not. This is a criminal case, so they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed some crime. And I think with the testimony of Dr. White, you have such a difference in the opinions of two such well-known experts that I think it creates a reasonable doubt that could weigh against the prosecution very heavily. So do you think this is being prosecuted wrongly? Do you think this no. is in the wrong court, that it's not criminal, that it's malpractice? Oh. No, what I, yeah, I, I thought you meant whether it was prosecuted wrongly during the trial. No, I don't right. think this case should be prosecuted. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that this case should have been handled in civil court as a medical malpractice case. I don't think this should be a criminal case. And I, I want to be very clear. I think that Dr. Murray was negligent in the way that he treated Michael Jackson. But because Michael Jackson has some self-involvement here, he's an adult, he knows how to handle his own business, and because there's the potential there that he could have self-administered this, he could have turned the drip on, and he was asking for it, basically begging for this drug, I think this is in the wrong court. I do think that, yes. Hmm. All right, well, let's listen to uh, some sound here from Dr. Paul White on the stand as he talks about uh, Jackson, him, he believing that Jackson gave himself that fatal, date, fatal dose of the anesthetic. Okay. Which of those scenarios is the more reasonable to you? Well, you're asking someone who's biased, of course, but I cannot understand how it's possible that he got a three-hour infusion when the evidence didn't show the infusion setup and the fact that the elimination of the drug in the urine is completely inconsistent um, with the amount of propofol that would have been administered had Mr. Jackson received this entire bottle of propofol, as, to, as suggested by Dr. Schaefer. So you think it was a self-injection of propofol near the hour of between 11.30 and 12 o'clock that, that did it? In my opinion, yes. Is it common, Justin, do you think, to see two experts kind of take shots at each other, as these two seem to have been doing on the stand? And does it, well, compromise I mean, their, does it compromise their testimony at all? No, I don't think it compromises their testimony. And I don't see these two as taking personal shots at one another. They just disagree. And that's why it's called an opinion. You know, there's a lot of people out there who are very well-educated who differ on opinions from somebody who's equally well-educated. It's, it's known that these two are like the two foremost people when it comes to anesthesia in this country, yet they differ so greatly on the opinion as to whether Dr. Murray is at fault in this case. This is very common when you're dealing with experts in medicine or experts in any high level of education. And I think that is going to be the problem for the prosecution in this case. When you're looking at this and you're deliberating it as a juror, you have to find that someone is guilty beyond any reasonable doubt. And when you look at two people who have such different opinions about something, you have to ask yourself, does that create the amount of doubt necessary to find this man not guilty. So I don't think it's about personal attacks amongst each other. I think it's really about whether or not these two people differ so greatly on such a, you know, a, such a specific issue. Does that create the doubt necessary to find him not guilty? And I think that it does. So if you were the prosecution and you were getting ready to cross-examine this witness, how would you go about doing it? This is a critical witness here. It's the last one, as we know it so far, to take the stand for the defense. I mean, do you come out with guns blazing? Well, 
You know, I know they spent the weekend uh, going over Dr. White's testimony with Dr. Schaefer, so I, I'm sure that Dr. Schaefer prepared them well for this, uh, for this cross-examination. You know, at this point, since this is the last and you're sort of getting the last word, I do th you have to go hard and aggressive. You don't want to be in any way disrespectful to Dr. White. You know, you want to be respectful. You want to, you know, make sure that you're being professional. But I think you have to try to use all of Dr. Schaefer's points as effectively as you can to try to hammer your point home and try to make it clear to the jury that you think that this is a case of gross negligence and try to get him to agree with some of the things that Dr. Schaefer had said so you can use that in closing. But again, when you have two people who are so top of their field who disagree so greatly, I think it creates a major problem when you're dealing in a criminal case because of the high burden that you have to prove. What about the but for argument? But for had Dr. Murray been there, giving him the propofol, making it accessible, leaving the room, not calling 911. I mean, you've got, you've got emergency medical teams who got on that stand and said, listen, if, or at least one doctor who said, if he would have called 911, this, this man was savable. Is d well, how, how great does that play into the prosecution's case, and, and can it override whether Michael Jackson injected himself or not? Well, I think that that's going to be where the prosecution has to go with this. They have to try to stack one mistake after another that Dr. Murray has made in order to show that he was negligent to the point of it being criminal. You know, when you start stacking those things up, you may be able to convince a jury that this was, in fact, criminal. But when you look at this from a broader perspective, and if you're the defense lawyer and you use the closing argument that even Dr. Schaefer admitted that Michael Jackson may have played a role in turning this IV drip on and giving the propofol to himself, Michael Jackson is an adult. We're not dealing with a child. So whether Dr. Murray walked out of the room while, doc while Michael Jackson had that drug available to him, I still think you have to look at the person who may have actually turned it on himself and given himself the fatal dose of propofol. If Michael Jackson did that and Dr. Schaefer admits it's possible, how can you find someone criminally responsible for that man's death? It's like if you say, you know, an adult is sitting in a room and you put your gun down on the table and that person takes your gun and shoots himself, you know, yeah, maybe you shouldn't have left a loaded gun in the room, but you still have an adult who can make very clear decisions for themselves making a poor decision. And I think that has to be part of the defense's clear closing argument that Michael Jackson played a very key role and he is somebody who has to be held partially responsible for this death. Mm -hmm. All righty. Justin Lido, thank you so much for your perspective. Thank you so much for having me again, Christy. Sure, Take care. Absolutely. Thank you. You too. Now, Dr. Stephen Schaefer.